Days are 158. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I gentlemen, ask for a recorded vote. Gentlemen from Colorado, recorded vote is requested. Those in favoring a recorded vote will rise. Efficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five minute vote. Five minutes. A vote now on passage of the rule regarding removing the EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. That would mean an hour of general debate divided evenly. And that would be a, a actually the last would be a vote on the journal of the previous day's record. So three votes in this series, the last two votes, five minute votes.
A motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is a question on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal, which the Chair will put de novo. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The journal stands approved. Mr. from Massachusetts. I ask, on that, I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. Five minutes. The last vote in this set is a vote on the journal of the previous day's record. And then after this, we expect an hour of general debate and votes on 12 amendments. The next set of votes could be closer to 6 this evening. Of course, members right now working on the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. That will be the subject, of course, of the general debate to follow this uh, set of this final vote. Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi is appealing to President Obama to halt the NATO operation to protect opponents of his regime. This is from the AP in a letter to uh, the president obtained by the Associated Press. Mr. Gaddafi implores the president to stop what he called an unjust war against a small people of developing country. A U.S. official confirms that the U.S. thinks the rambling three-page letter is authentic. And even as negotiations on 2011 federal spending continue here in Washington, the president is on the road this afternoon holding a town hall meeting near Philadelphia. He's also keeping a promise and appearing at a National Action Network event with the Reverend Al Sharpton this evening. The president will return to the White House tonight. In the meantime, the House Budget Committee is holding a meeting on the 2012 federal budget. Negotiators began this morning at 1030. It's expected to last all day. Apparently no breaks are scheduled in the hearing except for when the House is voting. So this could go until midnight. You can see those deliberations on our companion network, C-SPAN 3.
screen present. The journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Mr. Speaker, I would ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on the legislation that we're about to take up and to insert extraneous material on the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to the House Resolution 203 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 910. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Womack, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The committee will be in order. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 910, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to amend the Clean Air Act to prohibit the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency from promulgating any regulation concerning taking action relating to or taking into consideration the emission of a greenhouse gas to address climate change and for other purposes. The House will be in order. Committee will be in order. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield myself three minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, last November, Americans spoke with a very clear voice. They told us that we needed to get the country working again. They told us that big government was not the solution. They told us to lead or get out of the way on the, uh, on the economy. And our side got it, particularly with the cap and trade vote in the last Congress. Well, Mr. Chairman, today the House has a chance again to vote for a bill that directly responds to the demands of the American people. This legislation will remove the biggest regulatory threat to the American economy. This is a threat imposed not by Congress, but entirely by the Obama Environmental Protection Agency. We all know that this administration wanted a cap-and-trade system to regulate greenhouse gases, but Congress said no. So beginning in early 2009, EPA began putting together a, a house of cards to regulate emissions of carbon dioxide. The agency began with automobiles, declaring that their emissions endangered public health and welfare. That single endangerment finding has since been used by EPA to launch an unparalleled regulatory onslaught. The result two years later is a series of regulations that will ultimately affect every citizen, every job creator, every industry, really every aspect of our economy and way of life. And Mr. Chairman, this bill is about protecting jobs. EPA regulations will hit our manufacturing sector hard with direct limits on factory emissions, indirect costs from the higher prices to power their facilities. It'll hit small businesses hard, too, because when the electricity to power your business and the gasoline to fuel your vehicles is more expensive, your profits less, and you hire fewer new employees. That's why the NFIB, the Farm Bureau, NAM, and others, Chamber of Commerce, they have endorsed H.R. 910. This is a key vote with many of those different groups. Mr. Chairman, this bill is also about energy prices for working families power plants will be forced to comply with strict new emission caps. They'll have to purchase expensive new equipment to retrofit their facilities. And we all know the costs have nowhere to go except on family and businesses' monthly utility bills. And it is about gas prices. The refiners that turn oil into gasoline will also be caught into the web of costly regs. When it costs more to make gasoline, it costs more to buy gasoline. And with prices already at $4 a gallon across much of the country, the last thing that our families need is government policies designed to make the price at the pump even higher. I'm from Michigan. I know what a struggling economy indeed looks like. And I think that it is a travesty that this government is deliberately imposing policies that are going to harm job creators and working families. 
And for what, Mr. Chairman? For what? EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson herself admits that U.S. regulation of greenhouse gases will not affect global climate conditions. The only environmental impact may be to ship our jobs to countries with no environmental protections at all. So, Mr. Chairman, at the end of the day, the EPA climate regime is all economic pain and no environmental gain. So let's pass this bill today and get, American, get the American economy back on track. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself three minutes. Gentleman is recognized for three minutes. Since the Clean Air Act was adopted 40 years ago, we've made steady progress in cleaning our air and protecting the public health and welfare. Today, however, the Clean Air Act is under attack and progress is threatened. The Upton Inhofe bill is a direct assault on the Clean Air Act. Its premise is that climate change is a hoax and carbon pollution does not endanger health and welfare. But climate change is real. It is caused by pollution and it is a serious threat to our health and welfare. We need to confront these realities, not put our head in the sands. American families count on the Environmental Protection Agency to keep our air and water clean. But this bill has politicians overruling the experts at the Environmental Protection Agency, and it exempts our biggest polluters from regulation. If Upton Inhofe is enacted, the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to control dangerous carbon pollution will be gutted. That's why health experts like the American Lung Association are opposed to this legislation. They know it is a polluters protection act. It is anti-science, anti-environment, and anti-health. The Environmental Protection Agency made a scientific determination that carbon pollution endangers health and the environment. Our nation's top scientists at the National Academy of Sciences agrees with this finding and so do scientists around the world. Yet this legislation repeals that scientific finding. That's something no Congress has ever done. We need an energy policy based on science, not science fiction. With oil at $100 per barrel and rising, the Middle East in turmoil, and a nuclear crisis in Japan, we urgently need clean energy policies. We need more vehicles that run on electricity, natural gas, and renewable fuels. We need more wind and solar power, and we need more energy efficiency. What we need is to work together to develop energy policies that reduce our dependence on foreign oil and protect the health of American families. Instead, we are pursuing a divisive, partisan bill that takes us in exactly the wrong direction. This extreme legislation won't pass in the Senate, and if it did, it would be vetoed by President Obama. It is a distraction from the imperative of developing new sources of energy that will break our dependence on foreign oil, protect our health, and preserve our environment. American Americans want clean air to breathe and sensible science-based limits on carbon pollution. I urge all members to oppose this legislation and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield three minutes to the Chairman Emeritus of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the uh, distinguished chairman and would ask unanimous consent to uh, revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. I thank the uh, distinguished speaker. I rise in strong support of, of this bill. I'd like to make a few comments. First of all, the bill before us doesn't change one sentence or one paragraph in the Clean Air Act. It doesn't change anything. What it does do is prevent the EPA from using the Clean Air Act to regulate CO2 as a criteria pollutant under the Clean Air Act. Uh, I was in Congress when we passed the Clean Air Act amendments back in 1991. Uh, I was a co-sponsor of the bill. I worked on the bill in committee, voted for it on the floor. So I'm a supporter of a strong Clean Air Act. Uh, CO2 is not 
a criteria pollutant under the Clean Air Act. It was never intended to be. It's only because of a five to four Supreme Court decision that said the EPA had to make a decision whether it should be, and then a very flawed EPA endangerment finding when President Obama became the president, uh, that we have an EPA authority, tenuous as it is, to regulate CO2 under the Clean Air Act. And what this bill does is take us back to the original Clean Air Act and say, we're going to regulate the criteria pollutants, but greenhouse gases and CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, are not one of those criteria pollutants. What are the purported benefits of regulating CO2? Well, according to numerous studies, uh, in, in terms of the amount of reduction in CO2, by the year 2100, which is 90 years away, 89 years away, we would see a reduction of about three parts per billion if we regulated CO2 from the current 380 to 390 parts per billion. We'd see a reduction in temperature by about six thousandths to fifteen thousandths of a degree centigrade. And we would see a reduction in sea level rise by, a, by about seven thousandths of a centimeter. In other words, if we spend up to $100 billion a year to regulate CO2, we get no reduction in, in, in parts per billion, we get no reduction in temperature, and we get no reduction in sea level. But we do get a huge cost to the economy every year. This bill is a common sense bill that simply says the Clean Air Act is the Clean Air Act, and let's use it to regulate uh, 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 sulfur dioxide, and let's use it to regulate lead and particulate matter uh, and ozone, but let's don't use it to regulate a naturally occurring compound, compound which is necessary for life uh, and which helps us all. Please vote against all the amendments and please vote for this very common sense bill when we get to final passage. Lots of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I'm pleased to yield at this time to the ranking member on the Energy uh, Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the gentleman from California for uh, yielding his time, recognizing me for this uh, discussion. Mr. Speaker, I'm opposed to H.R. 910, the Upton and Hoff Dirty Air Act, because this bill is an extreme and excessive piece of legislation and is simply bad public policy. This bill will ignore the warnings from the respecting scientific community simply because policymakers do not like what that science is telling us, and it will place earnings and profits above protecting the American public. I applaud the Obama administration for making a clear and unequivocal statement uh, yesterday uh, that the president would veto this bill if it ever made it to his desk. Mr. Speaker, every respected, every notable scientific organization, including the National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, are all in agreement that man-made greenhouse gases do contribute to climate change and that these impacts can be mitigated through policy to curb these emissions. Uh, additionally, Mr. Speaker, many of the nation's top Public health advocacy groups, including the American Lung Association and the American Public Health Association, as, we, as well as leading civil rights groups such as the NAACP and the Environmental Law and Poverty Center, have all come out uh, strongly against this bill, saying that it will leave our most vulnerable citizens and our most vulnerable communities unprotected if this bill were to become law. As this USA poster here highlights, Mr. Speaker, there are so many more benefits in acting to address 
climate change, such as, uh, as the science tells us we must do, including energy independence, sustainability, cleaner air and water, and a healthier, more vibrant, more robust populace, just to name a few, than the option which is living with the status quo and hoping beyond hope that the majority of the world's uh, scientists are just playing wrong. Mr. Speaker, I'm opposed to this bill because the science compels me to be opposed to this bill, and I urge all of my colleagues, every one of you all, to vote uh, against this bill, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I would yield. Uh, I, I might ask the parliamentary inquiry, um, how much time has both sides used so far? Both sides have 24 minutes remaining. Okay. Um, I would yield three minutes to the chairman of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that we have this opportunity today to debate this important legislation. Over the last two years, the Environmental Protection Agency has been the most aggressive agency representing environmental causes in many, many years. Today we have an opportunity to try to stop their unprecedented power grab. Even the longest serving member of this House, the distinguished Democrat from Michigan, Mr. John Dingell, whom we all respect and admire, said it would be a glorious mess if EPA ever tried to regulate greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, one of the things they're trying to regulate is necessary for human life. When we had hearings on this issue, Lisa Jackson, the administrator of EPA, came to the Congress and she said, when asked a question, what kind of impact would their regulations have? She said it would have negligible impact on solving global warming unless other nations were willing to act as well. Now what this really gets down to is about coal, because coal in America produces 52 percent of our electricity. In China, coal produces about 80 percent of our electricity. Electricity is produced at the lowest rate with coal, and that is necessary if America is going to be competitive in the global marketplace. That's why today you see China expanding its coal marketing and coal utilities to produce electricity. That's why in China you see so many jobs being produced because they produce at a very low cost. This legislation will stop EPA from driving up electricity costs in America. We'll make it less likely that we're going to continue to lose jobs to China if we stop EPA. And I would remind all of you that when Gina McCarthy, the air quality director of EPA, came to Congress, she said herself that trying to regulate greenhouse gases in America just for the enforcing arms of the greenhouse gas bill, which would be every state in America, would cost the enforcing agencies $24 billion, not including the additional cost to all of the utility companies, those people have boilers, farmers, others, the additional cost that it would provide for them. So if we want America to be competitive, to create jobs, to compete with China, we must stop this out of control EPA. And that's precisely what this legislation is designed to do. We're not changing the Clean Air Act in any way. Ambient air quality, all of those things will still be enforced. So I would urge uh, passage of this legislation. Gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased at this time to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. The gentleman Martin. from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman. I rise in opposition to the Dirty Air Act, which overturns the scientific finding that pollution is harming our people and our planet. But as long as Republicans are making an ideological decision to overturn 
scientific reality. I wonder if the Republicans could offer an amendment overturning inconvenient geological reality as well. Let's tell the United States Geological Survey that Congress doesn't believe that the United States only has 2% of the world's oil as well. What the Republican majority is bringing to the House floor today is almost as absurd. Republicans want our only weapon against OPEC to be a bumper sticker slogan, drill, baby, drill. Well, I have news for my Republican friends. We are drilling, baby. U.S. production is at its highest level in nearly a decade. Domestic natural gas production is at an all-time high. But we will never be able to drill our way out of this problem. What Republicans fail to acknowledge is that a clean energy revolution is already underway. Take a look at the new electrical generating capacity installed in the United States in the last four years. The last four years. 80% of all new electrical generating capacity has been years. The last four years. 80% of all new electrical generating capacity has been natural gas, 33,000 new megawatts, and wind, 28,000 new megawatts. This is the last four years, ladies and gentlemen. Coal is down at 10,000, but rising very quickly. Solar at nearly 2,000 megawatts. Biomass at nearly 1,000 megawatts. In other words, there is a revolution that is already underway. The only problem is there is no long-term policy or certainty that has been put on the books. All we have are the Republicans fighting as hard as they can to prevent this revolution from coming to fruition so that we can dramatically reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that warm our planet, back out the oil that OPEC wants to uh, send us, uh, and create a new clean energy revolution here in America that produces jobs for Americans. This arbitrary rejection of scientific fact will not cause the gross domestic product to rise or, to, or for unemployment to fall. But here is what their bill will do. It will lead to higher pollution levels, which will rise. Oil imports, which will rise. Temperatures, which will rise. Job creation domestically, which will actually go down. Vote no on this assault on science, on public health, and on the American economic competitiveness that allows a revolution to take off, which makes it possible for us to solve the problems of employment, national security, and a dangerously warming planet. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield one minute to the Chairman of the Environment and the Economy Subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. The gentleman from minute. Illinois is recognized for one minute. I ask the unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it's great that we have this chance to be on the floor today to, uh, to really address one of the most important job creating pieces of legislation that we brought to the floor, and that's this one today. For the climate change believers, their plan is simple. Price carbon fuels so that we drive this new world of peace, security, and, and green energy, but they forgot one thing. They destroy jobs in doing that. These are well-known miners who lost their jobs the last time we did it. Thousands of coal miners in Illinois lost their jobs. Even in the greenhouse gas debate, it would add 50 cents a gallon to a, gas, to a gallon of gas. It, does that create jobs? It destroys jobs. We're, we're trying to price energy. All costs go up. So if you're concerned about the economy and you're concerned about jobs, this is the perfect bill to support. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield to my colleague from the state of California, Ms. Capps, uh, one and a half minutes. Gentleman from California is recognized for one and a half minutes.
thank my colleague, Mr. Chair. I rise in strong opposition to the dirty air bill. Once again, the House is considering legislation that has little to no chance of becoming law. Meanwhile, the public wants us to focus on job creation, but the leadership of this House isn't listening. The only job they seem interested in is the one they want EPA not to do, protect the public's health. It is not surprising that many of our nation's biggest polluters have asked for this bill. It lets them keep polluting. But what is surprising is that with this bill, we're rejecting scientific consensus. Even George W. Bush's EPA agreed that carbon pollution threatens the public's health. Mr. Chair, H.R. 910 will increase the pollution that triggers asthma attacks, respiratory illness, and premature deaths. It will hobble America's efforts to compete in the global energy marketplace. Earlier this year, the President stood on this House floor and talked about winning the future, about tapping into America's genius for innovation, and he used clean energy as a central example because it will help our economy grow. It will help America compete globally and protect the health and quality of life for all Americans. Let's not obstruct the EPA from doing its job of protecting the public's health. Let's not stick our heads in the sand about the dangers of climate change. Let's not turn away from meeting this challenge. Rather, build use it to build dominance in the global industry of clean energy. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this terrible bill, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields her time. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, yield uh, one minute uh, to the uh, gentleman on the committee, gentleman uh, from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. One gentleman minute. from Colorado is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 910, the Energy Tax Prevention Act, Without this bill, the EPA is going to outsource jobs and business with greenhouse gas regulations, not to mention placing huge financial burdens on consumers who will see energy prices skyrocket as a result of compliance costs to utilities, refineries, and more. However, what I want to talk a little bit about today is how it relates to rural America and agriculture, particularly in Colorado. The EPA has time and time again said agriculture is exempt. If agriculture exempt, then why did the Rural Electric Association in my district write to me and say it will cost farmers and ranchers in my state an additional $1,700 a year to irrigate their land if the carbon bill were to pass this Congress last year and signed into law by the President? $1,700 a year that carbon legislation would have cost farmers and ranchers in my state. By 2030, it would have cost them an additional $7,000 a year for one meter to run their irrigation. That's costing agriculture. That's costing jobs. Instead of becoming the Environmental Protection Act Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA is becoming the Everyone Pays a Lot Agency. Yield back my time. Gentleman from California. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that information is incorrect. I'd like to see a letter that pertains to this EPA action. I think it might have been a letter related to a different piece of legislation. I'm now pleased to yield two minutes to my colleague from California, Ms. Eshoo. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. I thank the uh, very distinguished uh, uh, ranking member of the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I rise in very, very strong opposition uh, to this bill, uh, H.R. 910. Uh, I can't help but think as I listen to what's being said on the other side uh, that uh, they're sitting in a car looking in the rear view mirror and they think they see the future. There is a reason why people on this side of the aisle are opposed to this bill and call it the dirty air bill because that's exactly what it is. And so instead of helping to create jobs for the American people, which is their top priority, their very, very top priority, this, what is the gift of the new majority? Dirty air. That's why the American Lung Association is vehemently opposed to this bill. The American Public Health Association is vehemently opposed to this bill. Former senior military officers, environmental organizations, and scientists all strongly oppose the bill. Now, guess who is for it? Guess who is for it, America? Big oil, because it will increase the demand for oil and do nothing 
to reduce consumer, what consumers spend on gasoline. This bill would put an end to future cost savings because both the EPA and states would be prohibited from updating the standards that they've already set. One would think that, there, that during this time of rising gas prices and the turmoil in the Middle East, that we would be voting on legislation to decrease our dependence on foreign oil, voting to drive innovation in clean energy industries, and voting to assure future security and achieve energy independence and leave the next generation of Americans with a healthy world. Instead, we're voting on a bill to gut the Clean Air Act. I think this is all uh, heavy evidence for members of the House to oppose the Dirty Air Act. The lady's time has expired. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, at this point I would yield two minutes to the former chairman of the Natural Resources Committee and the current ranking member on the Transportation Committee, gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Ray Hall. Two minutes. Gentleman from West Virginia is recognized for two minutes. I thank the distinguished chairman for yielding the time to me, and I appreciate uh, he and his committee's work on this legislation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think uh, anybody in this body is for dirty air or dirty water or any of the adjectives that have been used to describe the supporters of this legislation. Uh, certainly the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and other worthy pieces of legislation that Congress has passed over the decades have worthy goals and have achieved tremendous progress for this country. And there's not a person in this country, I dare say, that would want to renege on a, a lot of the uh, uh, positive initiatives that have been achieved under these pieces of legislation. No singular government agency, however, is sufficiently positioned to tackle the compact, complex solution that's required to address carbon emissions. The answer has to be multi-pronged. It must involve innovation and investment in addition to reductions. It must be crafted, taking into account the realities of the effect that these emission reductions will have on the economic recovery this country is currently experiencing and on jobs, and on jobs, especially in the heartland of America. These are not matters that the EPA required to, is required to consider or equipped to address. To simply allow the EPA to move ahead on its own in crafting a national strategy on climate change is a recipe for disaster. It assures a lopsided solution to a broad and cumbersome challenge. And what may be worse, it does not provide for the kind of transparency and the kind of public input that is needed for a viable long-term solution. It is one of the eternal truths of our form of government, Mr. Chairman, that the public has to be involved. It has to be informed, and the public must be engaged. This legislation is crystal clear in its message that the EPA has gotten ahead of a public opinion and that the Congress now has a responsibility to pull it back. I support this legislation, and I urge its passage today, and I yield back the balance of my time to the chairman of the committee. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to yield to the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Inslee, two minutes. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for two minutes. To revise and extend. Objection. Mr. Speaker, uh, we should oppose this Dirty Air Act because it would suggest that we are a nation in a deep and dangerous sleep, dozing in the face of disastrous pollution slumbering where our children are riddled with asthma. It's time for America to wake up, get up out of our comfortable beds of denial, and get to work building a new, clean economy. It's time to wake up, America. The Chinese are not sleeping while they build five times more wind turbines than us. The Germans are not sleeping building more solar panels. The Indians are not sleeping who are restricting carbon pollution. It is time to wake up. Nobody in human history has ever won a race while asleep. And that's why it's time for a national awakening by rejecting this bill. It's a time to put engineers to work on clean energy. It's a time to help business people to grow businesses. It's a time to help students learn new technology. It is an irony, but it's true. You can only dream while you're asleep, but you can only realize a dream when you're awake. We should believe in American exceptionalism. We are exceptional in innovation, exceptional in entrepreneurship, exceptional in pioneering technology. And if we do these things, the sun we see on the horizon will be a sunrise, not a sunset. It will be a sign of an awakening nation. 
We'll do this because we will know, and America can know the profound satisfaction of building a clean energy economy and producing children free of asthma rather than increasing it like this Dirty Air Act. Vote no against this small-minded exercise in pessimism. Vote no and embrace the optimism that is inherent in our national character. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I would at this point uh, yield uh, one minute to the gentlelady from Tennessee, Mrs. Blackburn, a member of the committee. The gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I rise in support of the legislation and thank our chairman, Mr. Upton, for bringing it forth and bringing forth a bill that will limit the EPA's regulatory overreach. It's important that we do. This is an issue that has been going on since 2007 when the Supreme Court gave the EPA permission to regulate greenhouse gases. At that point, I introduced a bill that would have stopped the EPA. Unfortunately, Congress didn't act, and the EPA has now issued a final rule, and there will be more rules and regulations on the way if Congress does not step in and take action to stop this. So I am grateful that we are stepping forward and making certain that this authority returns to Congress. I urge my colleagues to vote for H.R. 910 and reassert Congress's authority over this issue as it should be and take it away from unelected bureaucrats and I yield the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields the balance of her time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased now to yield to a distinguished member of our committee, Ms. Christensen from the Virgin Islands, two minutes. The gentlelady from the Virgin Islands is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the ranking member for yielding. As a representative of a district that has one of the highest greenhouse gas emission levels per square mile in the United States and the Caribbean, I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 910, appropriately known as the Dirty Air Act. As a physician and as a person who has been trained to make decisions on sound science, I have to reject this legislation that is based wrongly on the premise that there is no science that supports the court's decision that greenhouse gases are injurious to the public health. That premise is wrong. Once again, our Republican colleagues deny sound science in their attempt to achieve misguided and, in this case, harmful political ends. Leading scientific academies, associations, and think tanks have all clearly documented a clear connection between these gases and poorer health. And they make just as clear a connection of these gases to the acceleration of climate change, which adds another dimension of health challenges, some of which we are already facing today. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle tend to attribute the findings to the EPA administrator, but it's not she who's determined that these harm the public health. It was the scientific community, respected experts in the field. Mr. Speaker, the green, reduction of greenhouse gases is particularly important to poor and racial and ethnic minorities, as it has been shown that polluting industries are more often located in, near, in or near our communities. And I would like to ask unanimous consent to con insert a letter from the NAACP in opposition to 910. In committee, and I suppose today you'll hear a lot of talk about CO2, but that's not the only greenhouse gas that we're concerned about. The harmful group of gases also includes methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. The Virgin Islands has seen dramatic increases in asthma and cancers as the presence of these gases have increased. There is no way I can support this bill. No one should support it. We have a responsibility to protect the health of the American public. I urge my colleagues to reject H.R. 910 and to vote no to dirty air. I yield General back Lady, the balance. General Lady's time. time has expired. And General Lady's request for unanimous consent uh, will be covered by General Lee. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I would yield uh, one minute to the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Berg. Gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous uh, consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. This bill is a starting point to lowering energy costs. This bill encourages private sector investment and will grow jobs. You know, North Dakota is a leader in energy development. However, overreaching EPA regulation threaten not only energy producers but consumers as well. The EPA's efforts to impose a cap-and-trade tax threatens to increase the price of energy on American families. 
These higher energy costs will also impact small business, threatening them in enabling them and preventing them from growing the economy and creating the jobs. Our economy is suffering and heaping more taxes on American families and imposing new regulations will hurt job creation. It's not what our country needs now to get back on track. I firmly support the Energy Tax Prevention Act and I want to thank you and I'll yield the balance of my time. The gentleman yields his time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, for the purpose of a unanimous consent request, I yield to uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Mr. Gentlemen Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record a statement in opposition to H.R. 910. Without objection. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I now yield two minutes to the gentleman from the state of Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized for two minutes. I appreciate the gentleman's courtesy. I rise in strong opposition to this legislation, <clears throat> which makes a mockery of science, public health, international cooperation, the environment, the Supreme Court, and Congress. <clears throat> the problems with this bill starts with its title, the, quote, Energy Tax Prevention Act. The bill has nothing to do with taxes. I had an amendment to actually prevent the EPA from imposing an energy tax that the Rules Committee would not allow. <clears throat> During the rules debate, my colleague, Mr. Sessions from Texas, indicated the committee didn't because my bill, my amendment was, quote, not germane, because the bill doesn't have anything to do with taxes. Welcome to another journey down the legislative rabbit hole. Last week, the majority pretended that you didn't have to have both chambers of Congress to enact a law. This week, we have purposely misleading bill titles. The rule, by the way, did waive a point of order and germaneness for a provision added in committee, but the Rules Committee refused to allow to make in order an amendment that would actually prevent energy taxes. That's because there's no threat that the EPA will impose taxes. Instead, the agency's measured, reasonable approach to update the Clean Air Act to deal with carbon pollution will reduce health and economic costs. The tax moniker is not the only falsehood being floated about the EPA. Supporters have also claimed this bill would prevent rising gas prices. Pulitzer Prize winning PolitiFact has rated this claim false. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle understand that. They're taking a page from Frank Luntz's approach to environmental policy making. They don't want to have a fact-based fact debate about EPA's authority to limit carbon pollution. Instead, they're working to perfect the use of poll-tested, wildly inaccurate language to attack sound science and undermine confidence in laws that keep us safe. I hope my colleagues will join me in rejecting this unfortunate piece of legislation and the tactic that is being used to advance it. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this point, I yield two minutes to the distinguished chairman of the House Ag Committee, Mr. Lucas from Oklahoma. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of H.R. 910. For more than two years, we watched the Obama's Environmental Protection Agency try to expand its authority over American agriculture. Most telling of the EPA's irrational regulatory approach is how it is concluded that the breath we exhale, the gas that livestock expels, are dangerous pollutants and should be regulated by the Clean Air Act. During a recent Agriculture Committee hearing, the EPA administrator said agriculture is currently exempt from the proposed regulations because EPA has targeted only the largest greenhouse gas emitters. This doesn't provide any certainty to our farmers and ranchers, especially since in a recent interview, Lisa Jackson was quoted as saying that the EPA will begin looking at regulating greenhouse gases from farms as soon as 2013, which counters her own remarks at that hearing. Additionally, a mythical exemption doesn't insulate farmers, ranchers, and rural businesses from higher energy and operating costs. They'll face from other industries hit by these regulations. Whether it's the fuel in the tractor, the fertilizer for the crops, or the delivery of food to the grocery store, this backdoor energy tax will increase the cost of doing business in rural America. I urge my colleagues, join us in passing H.R. 910, the Energy Tax Exempt Prevention Act, and protect agriculture from the EPA's overreach. This bill will prevent the EPA from running wild across America's farms and subjecting our producers to more burdensome regulations and threaten to put them out of business. Rural America has never stopped being a good place to live, so it's our job to make sure it's a good place to make a living too. 
yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his